and together as we sing these three stanzas. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come before your presence today with glory and honor and praise on our lips. Father, we thank you for your work among us, for who you are, for your life that you gave so that we might know eternal life. Father, we give you praise and honor. Lord, as the word is open today, we pray that Lord, that your spirit might speak to every heart in life today and that, Father, we would be obedient to all that we hear because, Father, we do want to serve you. We want to be more like you and we want to uh, let our light point and direct others to you. Father, we thank you for the light of Christ. We thank you, Father, for missionaries all around the world who are helping to spread that good news of Jesus Christ to those who need to know. Father, we pray, Lord, that you might help in every facet of this missionary effort. That, Father, that we might be a part of that through our giving and that, Father, we too might be a part of it by telling others right here around us because there are people here who need to know uh, Jesus Christ as well as all of those around the world. So Father, help us to be um, about the, uh, the, uh, the task of telling others of you, helping others to know your love, your salvation as we walk with you each and every day. 
We pray all of these things now in the name of our Father, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We do welcome you to uh, Union Baptist Church this morning. Dr. Rice is away uh, from us today. He's, at, he's going to be in a, a nice, long, boring meeting uh, for a couple of days in Atlanta area. And so you pray for him as he continues to travel and teach also during this week. And then he will be back with us uh, next Sunday as well. Brother Kyle is away from us today and his family uh, are away from us for uh, some time of, of, of rest and relaxation and vacation. So you pray for them as they are traveling and enjoying this time, these days away from us as well. We are delighted that you have chosen to be here this morning with us. And if you are our guest, if this is the first time that you're visiting with us, we want you to take the card out of the rack in front of you in the pew. And if you would fill that out with your information, we'd have an opportunity to perhaps share with you more about the ministries of our church. And as you depart the sanctuary this morning, there'll be someone at the desk in the foyer. If you just hand them uh, that card, they will in turn uh, give you a gift and it's our way of saying thank you for being here and that we want to know more about you and uh, we are delighted to have this morning Noah Hassler who's filling the pulpit this morning uh, in Dr. Rice's absence so we are uh, we look forward to how God is going to use uh, uh, you in, in sharing with us this morning what the Lord has laid on your heart we are celebrating the season of Advent, that time of preparation, preparing that we go through to celebrate the, the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And coming to light the second candle of the Advent wreath this morning is Debbie Pearson. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. This is the second candle of the Advent wreath. Uh, this candle is the Bethlehem candle, and it's reminding us of the Messiah's birthplace. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, Micah prophesied that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of the Messiah. That passage in Micah 5.2 is what Debbie read just now. Two lights are now lit. The light is growing stronger. And although Bethlehem was a small, insignificant Judean village, from this town would come God's own son, the light of the world. Let's sing about that town, that little town of Bethlehem this morning as we continue to worship.
Introducing Noah to you, I forgot that he has uh, his lovely wife Anna is with him today as well, and we welcome both of you to uh, Union Baptist Church this morning.
Good morning. Like it was said earlier, my name is Noah, and uh, I am a student at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and I am delighted to be with you this morning. And I just want to thank Dr. Rice for inviting me to uh, preach in his place this morning. And what a fitting time for me to be here uh, in the season of Advent. And uh, I'm just super encouraged by the missionaries that were here before us today. And I want us to see today the message that we are proclaiming, whether it be here in Mississippi or whether it be in India or the Philippines or China or wherever it might be, this message is what we proclaim. And I want to take us back 700 years before Jesus was even born to the book of Isaiah. So if you would turn with me to Isaiah chapter 52. And we're going to start in verse 13. And today I want us to see that the suffering servant that we will read about will move us forward to a better Israel and prophet, which culminates in Jesus, whose person and work give us right standing with God. Now, today's passage has multiple contexts. First, this text is within Isaiah chapter 40 through 55, which is referring to a people to be exiled in Babylon, but a possibility for restoration. Secondly, this is one of four servant songs, and this is the fourth of those four. And the the four are chapter 42, verse 1 through 9. 49, verse 1 through 7, 50, verse 1 through 11, and where we are, chapter 52, verse 13 through 53. So I'm going to read, and I want to pray for our time. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look in him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned, everyone, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, 
make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercessor, intercession for the transgressors. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. We thank you that your son, Jesus, has come to the world. He has come to the world to save a people for himself. And we know that through Jesus' death and resurrection that we can be counted righteous. But that did not come without great cost. It cost your own son. And I pray today that your word would be rightly preached this morning and that we as your people would see and savor the Savior. And I pray that if there's anyone in this room that is not trusting Christ, that they would hear the gospel clearly and believe. And I pray that you would speak through me this morning. Amen. Looking a little more closely, chapter 52 anticipates God saving Israel in particular, but then zooms out to the ends of the earth in 52.10. So it says, The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And as a people who are about to be enslaved into a foreign land, that is a message of hope in the midst of suffering. Now, this suffering was brought about by their own sinfulness. God calls, called the people to be a nation of priests and a holy nation. He called them to love God and love their neighbor. He told them to clothe the foreigner. He told them to execute justice in the land. Yet, the people were a stiff-necked people. Even though God had brought them out of the land of Egypt and going to the land of promise, they still wanted to go back to, to Egypt. They still wanted to go back into slavery. They were the people who were stubborn, who often forgot. And today, I want to show us four truths about the suffering servant and how they are fulfilled in Jesus. Because when the original audience would have read this, Jesus had not yet come. So they are awaiting a Messiah who is going to come and take away their sins. But before we get to Jesus, we need to see what this text is, is, is showing us and how Jesus is the fulfillment of this. So the first thing, as it relates to who the servant is, is that the servant is a better Israel, a more obedient Israel, and prophet. Throughout much of Isaiah, the term for servant is used for the nation of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 41, and many other places, God calls Israel his servant. And it, the connotation there is like that of a slave. But they are servants of God. Just like I said earlier, they, he called them to be a kingdom of priests. God's servants in order to live rightly in the land to display God's character to the nations. And even in chapter 48, it says, Go out from Babylon, free from Chaldea. Declare this with a shout of joy. Proclaim it. Send it out to the end of the earth, saying, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Because even though Abraham, even all the way back to Abraham, he was worshiping false gods. And the Lord told him to leave his land and go into the land of promise that later Israel would inhabit. But then when you arrive at chapter 42, when you arrive at these 
four songs, it becomes unclear who the servant is. The meaning shifts from Israel to this suffering servant. In chapter 49, verse or chapter 42, verse 1 through 9, the first song, the servant has been chosen by God to release Israel from captivity, execute justice on the nations, and be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations. In chapter 49, verse 1 through 7, the second song, the servant is utilized to bring Israel back to God from their idolatry and to be a light to the nations. In the third song, chapter 50, verse 1 through 11, the servant is utilized to give Israel a picture of the servant's perfect obedience as an example to follow in contrast with their disobedience. And the fourth song, where we are today, the servant is utilized as a guilt offering, dying in the place of the sins of the nations. The Lord has laid the iniquities of all upon him, and by his arm may we all have peace through the servant's sacrifice. Whereas Israel intermarried with women of foreign nations as God told them not to and worshiped false gods, the servant is being utilized as an example of obedience to bring the nations to repentance. And also, Isaiah functions as a servant of the Lord. And he's not the only prophet that functions as a servant of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 6, when he receives his call from God, it says this, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And like many of the prophets, Isaiah was charged to speak God's word to the people. And many times it was words of judgment. It was, words, it was hard words as they were walking in disobedience. And in Isaiah's case, he was to speak to them to make their hearts dull, to make their ears heavy, and to blind their eyes. It is to show the condition that they were already walking in. But even with all the prophets and all of Israel, Isaiah cannot turn their hearts from idols to the living God. Isaiah, though he can preach God's word, he is not the one who changes their hearts. And so, though he was a good prophet, the servant is a better prophet. The servant will make many to be counted righteous. Isaiah could not make anyone righteous. And so I, want us, I wanted to, to, to start there as we look at the text. And the servant is the arm of the Lord. I want us to see that. Chapter 53, verse 1 says, And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, When they read arm of the Lord, maybe we we might miss that, but that is a loaded statement. And this is showing the very power of God. The very power and effective power of God is being revealed to the nations in the servant. And if you look throughout the Old Testament, this phrase comes up many times. The arm of the Lord created the heavens and the earth. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. The arm of the Lord delivered Israel from Egypt. The arm of the Lord parted the Red Sea. 
the arm of the Lord drove out the nations from the promised land that they were going to inhabit. The arm of the Lord exiled Israel to Babylon. The arm of the Lord returned the remnant to Jerusalem from exile. This same effective power of God who created the world and rescued Israel from Egypt is the same effective power who is the servant of the Lord through whom he will bring salvation. So they may not know the exact identity of who he is, but they know that he is the one through whom salvation is coming. And so as we look at what the servant is going to do, we see that the servant has been revealed to the nations through suffering. So even in the first phrase of our text, behold, it denotes a transition from the previous chapter. And as we have already read 52.10, he is, he is showing us that through the servant is the means by which he will bring salvation to the ends of the earth. The question is being posed in 53.1 as to whom the arm of the Lord is being revealed to. If you see who has believed what he has heard from us. And there's, a, there's even an implied answer in that question. Not many. To whom? Who has believed? Who has believed what the Lord has already revealed? A people that has been delivered from Egypt. A people that has been given the land of promise. A land flowing of milk and honey. And he asks them to love God and neighbor. And they still don't believe what they have heard. We see that the servant has astonished the nations, causing the kings of the nations to have understanding in something in which they did not see or hear. Kings shall shut their mouths from him, and for that which has not been told, they see. For that which has not been, that they have not heard, they understand. So there's something that is anticipating some act that they have not heard, but they will see and they will be astonished. And now we, we kind of transition to looking at what, what is it that the servant has done? What, what does this mean for us? What is what is this pointing us to? And there are three ways that we see the servant has suffered. The, the servant's appearance has become inhuman and without beauty. So the first few verses of chapter 53 says that he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. This is supposed to be the salvation of the Lord that's coming to the nations. The root out of dry ground with no form or beauty or majesty in him. And this imitates language from Isaiah chapter 11, 1, where it says, There shall come forth from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Well, if we know who Jesse is, Jesse is the father of King David. And King David received the promises of God that there will not fail to be someone that sits on his throne. And if we think, if we even look at Matthew chapter 1 and the genealogy that seems so out of place, we see that Jesus himself is a descendant of the line of David. David. So even in Isaiah chapter 11 and 53 is picking it up that though this servant has no form or majesty or beauty that we should see in him, there is something glorious that's going to happen. There is something glorious that is going to happen. And his 
appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind and is even one from whom men hide their faces. When I think of a great king, I don't think of someone whom I hide my face from. But this servant is. And the servant is actually more so than having no beauty or majesty, he is despised by the nations. Looking at 53, he was despised and rejected by men. And he is a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was despised and and we esteemed him not. At 53.4, we esteemed him stricken. He not only had no beauty or majesty, but he was hated by the nations. And even worse, the servant was executed by the nations. 53.7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And this is done in sight of the nations. The servant is being revealed in his suffering. But... I haven't mentioned the middle section. The servant has been exalted by God through suffering. The servant, as it says, will act wisely and will prosper. And another way to say act wisely would be to say to accomplish his purposes. And as we know from 52.10 that those purposes are God's salvation. But then even... But then even it says, Behold, my servant shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. He will be divided a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. This is the same servant that has no beauty or majesty or or nothing that we should look at him? This is the same servant? Well, here's why. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned. Everyone everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So how could such a lowly servant with no beauty or majesty that we should look at him be exalted in such a way? Because he is able to bear the sins of many. He is able to take on our sins. He died in the place of the nations to make intercession for them even though he was innocent. This lowly state and death shows that the servant endures not just because of the nations, but in place of the nations. Because even in verse 8, he was stricken for the transgression of the people. Transgression denotes rebellion. We are rebels. They and us, we are rebels against God. We are transgressors. And the, the picture is that we, like sheep, have gone astray because our sin has carried us that way. 
we are like those who has not believed. We are the ones who don't believe. We are the sheep who go astray. We have turned everyone, not just some, everyone. We have turned to our own way. But he was led like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. And this picture is actually being picked up from Leviticus chapter 16, the Day of Atonement. And this is where once a year the priest would kill one goat and release another into the wilderness. The goat would be, who would be released into the wilderness would be pronounced, the sins of the people would be pronounced on it. They'd put their hand on his head and pronounce the sins of the people on this goat and release it out of the camp into the wilderness. And the second one would be sacrificed as a guilt offering, dying in the place of the people. But now this is a person. He is both taking on the sins of the people and dying in their place. So now, I want us to see how the person and work of the servant culminate in Jesus. Jesus is the better Israel and prophet. He was perfect. He lived his life without sin. He was tempted. In the wilderness, Jesus was tempted by Satan multiple times and yet did not sin. Jesus came to speak God's word. He came to deliver the captive. He came to seek and save the lost. And he is able to actually change someone's heart. He is actually able to bring someone to God. Jesus is the arm of the Lord. If it didn't seem so clear. God's arm was even at work in the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 1. In Mary's song of praise in Luke chapter 1, she uses the term in the context of Jesus' birth. So just as God's own arm delivered his people out of exile, God's own arm sent his own son to the world. And even Jesus tells the Pharisees themselves that he is the arm of the Lord. And John chapter 12, it says, When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. And Jesus has been revealed to the nations through suffering, and Jesus has been exalted by the Father through suffering. I want us to see, when we read this, maybe they didn't know who Jesus was, but when we read this, we need to say, Jesus has surely borne our griefs. As it says in 53.4, Jesus has carried our sorrows. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon Jesus was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with Jesus' wounds, we are healed. All of us who are believing in Christ, all of us who are trusting in Christ, we're like sheep that have gone astray. And we have all turned to our own way. But the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. There is no basis which we sinners can stand before God. For example, if we were to commit a crime, we cannot stand before the judge and tell him how religious we have been. 
We cannot tell the judge, well, I've done so much community service. I'm a member of Union Baptist Church. I have been in the choir for 30 years. I am the most moral person I know. Well, the judge is going to say, well, you still committed a crime. And Isaiah 59 says that our sins have created a separation between us and God. God will not stand in the place of our sin. God will not allow us to come into his presence with our sin because he is a completely good and fair and just God. But the beautiful thing is, is that Jesus has come in on our behalf. Even though we, like sheep, have decided to go our own way, Jesus, he lived the life that we never could. He was the more obedient prophet. He was the better Israel. He was the culmination of all of the promises of God fulfilled in him. And yet, he died for our sins. Yet, he died instead of us. We often, we often miss that. We often don't r wrestle with the mystery of that. Why, why would God send Jesus, who had not, he had not committed a single sin, to die as if he had? He was punished for our sins. Our sins put him on the tree. 1 Peter chapter 2 says that he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. This was done before the nations. This is the message that the apostles took the, to the nations. This is the message that they took to the ends of the earth. Jesus has died and rose again. And he will be exalted one day. And he will be exalted one day. And as Philippians 2 beautifully states, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So just as the suffering servant was a better Israel, a better prophet, just as the suffering servant was revealed to the nations through his suffering and died in the place of the nation, so Jesus is a better Israel. So Jesus is a better prophet. So Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has been revealed to the nations and will be glorified by his people. And this is a message that we are to proclaim. So I, wanna, I want us to conclude our time by just thinking through what does this mean? What does this mean for me? There's a couple ways that this could, could apply to us today. For those who are trusting in Christ, for the one who has recognized their sin for what it is and understand that, that they are like the sheep that has turned away to his own way. And if 
turned to Christ, have, has clinged to Christ in desperation over our sin and the coming salvation of Jesus, well, this should be a message of hope. It is, is glorious that God himself has chosen to save us in Christ. And I want us to delight and, and rejoice and to worship our King because of the great work He's done in us. I want us to make it our life's work to proclaim this very message to the world. I want to make it our life's work to walk in the way that Jesus walked. And for those who might not have ever heard this message before, those who might not have ever heard the Gospel explained like this, the gospel is offered to all. It is extended to all people. And if you turn away from your sin, if you turn away like the sheep was turning away from God, but if you turn away from your sinfulness and to Christ, recognizing that, that it is not on your merits, it's not on your righteousness, it's not on your religiosity in order to stand right before God, but it's on the right standing with Jesus. It's based on the righteousness of Jesus. Trusting in that, believing in that, desperately clinging to Him, then God says that everyone who calls upon His name will be saved. And I invite us to go from this place a worshiping people. Because He lives, so we also live. Let me pray for us, and if you find yourself today um, wrestling with, with this idea of believing in Jesus, turning from your sin and, and turning to Christ, I invite you to, to turn to Him. Talk to me. Talk to, talk to one of the, your friends. Talk to one of the leaders here, and we want to talk with you. We want you to, to experience the joy that comes only through Him. Let me pray. Lord, we thank You for this morning. We thank You that this prophetic Word that was given to us 700 years before Jesus was even born was spoken. And that even though at first, it seems that this servant it has no beauty that we should desire in him, that he was despised and dejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, even though all these things were said, that Jesus has bore our griefs and that he has carried our sorrows, that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities and that with his wounds we are healed. And I pray that your word would dwell with us today and that you would help us to leave from this place worshiping and rejoicing in the finished work of Jesus. And I pray that if there's anybody here that is not trusted in Jesus, that you would open their eyes, that you would give them understanding to believe. And we just ask that ultimately this would be grounds to give your name glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way.